Hi everybody, Tim Garner here. This is week three of our overview study of Deuteronomy. Uh, let's get started, a lot of material to cover. Share my screen. Scoot over out of the way there. So here's our core idea, the core verse really of the book uh, that we've read so often in our worship services, as I've said. Um, about hearing the Lord. So let me move over here where I can click. All right. So here's the outline of the book that we're more or less using to uh, follow along. We did the, the first section on retrospective, the retrospective last week. This week we're going to do uh, the introspective um, sermon, the Moses second sermon in chapters 5 through 26. This week we'll cover uh, chapters 5 through 8. And of course, if we, as we think about introspect, introspection, reflection, whatever, uh, let's try a little bit of humor, a little bit of Calvin. Calvin's watching TV and he says, nowadays ads don't just sell a product, they sell an attitude. Look at this one. Here's a cool guy saying nobody tells him what to do. He does whatever he wants and he buys this product as a reflection of that independence. Hobbes' comment as he watches is, so basically this maverick is urging everyone to express his individuality through conformity in brand name selection. And Hobbes deflated, or uh, Calvin deflated says, well, it sounded more defiant the way he said it. And Hobbes just goes, hmm. So as we look at the detailed outline here of uh, the book of Deuteronomy, you can see last week we talked about what God has done for Israel in the historical section. This week we'll talk about what God expects of Israel in the legal section. More specifically, we'll talk about the explanation of the Ten Commandments in chapters 5 through 11. Uh, and, and then we'll talk about, uh, specifically in chapters 5, the covenant of the great king. I'll explain that title when we get there. And also in chapter 6, the command to teach the law. Chapter 7, the command to conquer Canaan. And in chapter 8, the command to remember the Lord. So chapter 5, real quickly, let's get into some of the lessons for today. So the covenant of the great king, the title for the chapter, um, is taken more or less from a book written by Meredith Klein called The Treaty of the Great King, where he, he examines the covenant structure of Deuteronomy. He looks at it in terms of the book being a legal document of binding agreement between God and Israel. And so that seemed like an appropriate, especially given the wording, the shalls and shall nots and command and observe and do and all those things, uh, the way that uh, God explains uh, his covenant to the people. It just made sense. But let's dig into some of the lessons here. So we must hear God's word to learn it. And then naturally we must learn God's word to observe it. Hearing, learning, observing. It's just a natural progression. Uh, the law of Moses was, as it's stated here in uh, verse two through four, the law of Moses was for the Jews, not for the people of every time and every place. Um, it says there that uh, God made the covenant with us at Horeb. The Lord, the Lord did not make his covenant, this covenant with our fathers, but with us. And we need to also learn when God stops talking, uh, so should we. In uh, verse 22, uh, the principle for us is, uh, uh, well, as stated by uh, Moses there, God made the two tablets of stone and gave them to Moses. And it says, after he made them, he added no more. And Second John 9 for us says, anyone who goes too far and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. The one who abides in the teaching, the one who remains in the teaching, he has both the Father and the Son. So then as we look at the Ten Commandments, we see that in some way, shape, or form, they're all repeated in the New Testament, but really repeated in a more, a deeper, more spiritual way. So let's see if we can kind of break some of that down. And I'm not going to go through every single one of the commandments. Uh, there's a slide here. If you, if you want this slide, I can certainly uh, send it to you. You can send me a message to uh, the email address there at the bottom, info4garner 
at gmail and I'll send you a copy of this slide. I want us to focus on just a few of these to try to understand because the, the Ten Commandments are the Ten Commandments, but there's always the question that comes up that I want to answer. Do we follow the Ten Commandments today? And the best way to answer that question is to answer this question. What did Jesus say? Um, so, for example, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 22, thereabouts, uh, Jesus says, You've heard that it was said, Thou shalt not murder. But I say to you that everyone who is angered with his brother shall be guilty, guilty of all kinds of things. But really what Jesus is saying is murder, he's telling us murder is an overt act. But the real cause, the spiritual issue, is anger, is hate. You've heard that it was said, thou shalt not commit adultery. But Jesus says, everyone who looks at a woman with lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So he takes an overt act, the adultery, and he spiritualizes or internal, internalizes it. He takes it further. He takes it, makes it a deeper issue. You've heard that it was said, thou shalt not make false vows. Jesus says, but I say to you, make no, no, make no oath at all. Let your statement be yes, yes, or no, no. Keep it simple. Anything beyond that um, is of evil, or at least evil. So as we look at the idea of the commandments then, and the idea of commandments or law today, um, you know, we first need to understand that fundamentally, as Christians, we cannot justify ourselves before God with any law that we keep. We just can't do it. Uh, Ten Commandments, any law. But at the same time, it is true that we do follow law. And to elaborate on that, we need to look further to see what does the New Testament say. Well, Paul said in helping restore a, a fellow Christian that's fallen, he says, if we bear one another's burdens, we thereby full, fulfill the law of Christ. So would Jesus help restore someone? Well, of course he would. What did he do with Peter? After Peter had denied him three times, he restored him. That's the law of Christ, to do the best, the best thing, the most compassionate thing uh, in any relationship where we can. And then there's the perfect law, the law of liberty. Um, be hearers, be effectual doers. That's what we're supposed to be. That, that's what defines our pure religion. More specifically, pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God, verse 27 of James 1, uh, is this, to visit orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. So the law of Christ, or the perfect law, is the one we follow because it's pleasing to God. It demonstrates our dedication to being a disciple and friend to Jesus. It gives us the opportunity to show the depths of God's love to everybody around us. The law of Christ, or the perfect law, is the one we follow because it has a much deeper spiritual meaning for us. And even when we falter, and we will falter, we have that fountain of grace in the life, in the person, in the blood of Jesus. So let's look further at some of the lessons in uh, chapter five, uh, the covenant of the great king. So God does speak with man, verse 24 of chapter five. The people there said, we have seen today that God speaks with man, yet he lives. Um, we go and hear all that the Lord says with an open mind. <clears throat> we speak to others all that the Lord has spoken to us with our open mouth. Uh, we hear with open ears, and we do with an open and giving life all that has been spoken to us from the Lord. We see also here the basic principle of fearing God and keeping all his commandments. It's the whole of man. Uh, we're supposed to observe them wherever we are with all of the resources that God has given uh, to us. Life and prosperity comes, for, uh, comes to those who follow God's word and, and does not deviate from them. Now, this is not health and wealth. This is simply a, a natural progression, a natural consequence of being a follower of, in our case, a follower of Jesus. The moderation that we live, the sharing and generosity that we practice, 
the compassion that we show to those that are in need, uh, that's going to give us spiritual prosperity and natural in many cases because of the frugality and the, the sense, the, as I say, the moderation involved. It's going to give us uh, uh, all that we need, all that we need. So then Deuteronomy 6 lessons, the command to teach the law. Excuse me, teach, teaching begins with hearing. Hearing leads to obedience and obedience to spiritual prosperity as, as we've seen. So God has commanded uh, me, Moses says, to teach you that you might do them in the land. God taught Moses, Moses taught them so that they may do them in the land. Uh, he goes on and says, you should listen and be careful to do it, that it may be well with you. And loving God with all our, all our being is the greatest or most fundamental commandment. Uh, Matthew chapter 22, Jesus said, said it a little bit differently. Uh, here in uh, Deuteronomy 6, it says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Well, heart, soul, mind, and strength, heart, soul, and mind, heart, soul, and mind. What is Moses and Jesus, what are Moses and Jesus trying to convey? Love the Lord your God with every aspect of your being in every way you can imagine and with every resource you have at your disposal. Be creative in how you get the words and thoughts of Jesus into your everyday life. Um, a lot of you have demonstrated very inventive ways to do that. I've even heard of um, technical people with, uh, that have to use very long passwords. They actually uh, use encryptions of songs and verses and proverbs and, uh, you know, Bible verses, that kind of thing. And so every time they, they use a password, every time they use that phrase, uh, they're remembering uh, some great thought or some great verse. God's word must be in our heart, our house, our hands, before our eyes, uh, on our doorposts. We're supposed to talk about it when we lie down. We're supposed to talk about it when we're walking uh, with our children, with our grandchildren, with our spouses. Uh, every way that we can, we try to weave it into our lives. And we have to be careful. We have to be wary. Uh, he says there, when people get full, they often forget. The way uh, Moses says it, watch yourself that you do not forget the Lord who brought you from the land of Egypt uh, into the new land or the land of promise. What else in chapter six? Do not try or test God. This is a reference to uh, Massah or Meribah in Exodus chapter 17, verse seven. The people grumbled and quarreled and complained because there was not enough water. And they tested the Lord. And they said, is the Lord among us or not? And he's telling them here, don't do that. Do not try or test God. You should have learned better by now. When our children ask about God's word, we must be prepared to tell them where we came from, why we are here, and where we are going. That goes back to the idea of sharing the heritage of our faith, uh, why we are what we are, why we believe what we believe, that kind of thing. Uh, in the case of the Israelites, they would have talked about their history as slaves in Egypt, the deliverance by Lord, uh, the Lord that they witnessed uh, with great miracles and, and God's power, being delivered from slavery into the blessings now in the land of promise. And remember also that God's law is always, always, always for our good. It's for our survival, as he puts it there in uh, chapter 6, verse uh 20 and 23, or uh, 24, rather. Really. So here's a map, and in the process of conquest, here's all the peoples that they're going to uh, dispossess, as it said, from the land. You can see the Hittites, the Kenites, the Hivites, the Perizzites, a lot of ites, Moabites, Edomites, and so on. Uh, and basically, that's what chapter 7 is getting into, is how they're to behave as they enter the land. And the principle for us is a close association with worldliness will cause God's people to turn away from God. They're to be very, very exact as they defeat uh, these people. 
and utterly destroy them. Um, they're not supposed to make a covenant with them. They're not supposed to intermarry with them. They're not supposed to allow the influence of idolatry to uh, intermingle with their uh, faith in God, their practice of following God. So what's our application? Well, obviously there's, there's several, but one of them that we need to talk about is Romans chapter 12, where Paul says, we're to present our bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And he says, do not be conformed. Don't blend in. Don't mix in. Don't become like the world, but be transformed away from the world by the renewing of your mind. So that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Uh, John said in 1 John 2, and verse 15 and 16, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. So let's remember that we're God's possession and that he chose us out of love. We are his own possession, as he puts it there in uh, verses 6 through 8. God is faithful and trustworthy, so help me 1 Corinthians 1, 9 and 10, 13. He is uh, faithful and trustworthy to re reward the obedient and punish the disobedient. To the thousandth generation, that's put in that passage there in verse 9 through 11. And blessings come to all who obey God. Uh, because you listen to these judgments, he said, and keep and do them, the Lord your God will keep keep with you his covenant and his loving kindness, which he swore to your forefathers. He will love you and bless you and multiply you. It's just a natural consequence of following God. What else? The command to conquer Canaan, do not fear the enemy. Uh, do not fear the enemy with whom we battle for God is on our side and he will deliver him, in our case, Satan, into our hand. You can refer to Ephesians chapter six, verse 10 through 18 there. Of course, we've all had uh, moments where we said, these nations are greater than I, like the people are saying. How can I dispossess them? Um, but God says we're not supposed to be afraid of them. We're supposed to remember what the Lord God did in our lives. And we can all look back on our lives and think about insurmountable, what appeared to be insurmountable ob uh, obstacles that we overcame. We'll always have those moments of these nations are greater than I. But with God's help, we will always dispossess them, as, as it's said there. And if we do not battle the worldliness around us, we will find ourselves snared by it. That's why they're to get rid of the graven images. They're to burn them with fire. Um, they're to utterly abhor it, stay away from it, uh, and not be involved in it at all. And now in chapter 8, he talks about the command to remember the Lord. And this, this gets more into the idea of introspection. So he says, Observe, uh, observing God's commandments leads to spiritual life and prosperity. You shall be careful, he says, to do that you may live and multiply. It, again, it's just a natural progression. If we follow God, if we practice uh, his commands, his word, his, his way of life, then it will uh, lead to spiritual life and prosperity. We should always remember and be thankful for the ways that God has cared for us and uh, led us through hard times, difficult times. God gives opportunities in life that will test whether or not we will humbly trust and obey him. It says there in uh, verse 3, he, hum he humbled you and let you be hungry. He let them be hungry. He was teaching them. Uh, the idea was for them to learn to depend on God not on bread, but by everything that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord, every word, as Jesus put it in Matthew chapter 4, verse 4, and Luke 4, verse 4. When Jesus answered Satan in his temptation, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And we need to remember that we cannot live without God. We just simply cannot live without God. Um, he sustains us. We could spend a long theological discussion talking about that. And then finally, we need to understand and recognize and welcome, in fact, be thankful for the discipline of the Lord. Hebrews 12 says that uh, uh, whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. 
He scourges every son whom he receives. That's also in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 11 and 12. So what else? Bless God for the fullness he gives us because he, in fact, is bringing us into a good land, spiritually speaking, as he said to the uh, Israelites there. We should beware that fullness can lead to forget forgetfulness. We can see that here are kind of a breakdown of the two threats. There was an outward influence, the worldliness in chapter 7. And here there's the inward arrogance where they may forget. They may forget God. And very simply put, folks, the way we forget God is by stopping, by not practicing his good word. Uh, the good, practical, logical, helpful things that he's taught us all of our life. Uh, God gives us the power. He gives us the resources. There's always the resources around us to get the things that we need to be great servants, better servants. I, I actually pray that frequently. Uh, I don't know exactly what you have planned for me, Lord, but give me the resources. Give me the things that I need to be a better servant uh, in your kingdom. And then finally, God's people will be punished just like the world if they are disobedient just like the world. They'll perish just like the people of the world if they fail to follow God's word. So final thoughts on introspection. Well, Calvin says, the Christmas season is always a time for personal reflection. Too often we don't examine our lives. This is a time to take stock and think about what's important. It's a time to rededicate oneself to frenzied acquisition a time to spread the joy of material wealth, a time to glorify personal excess of every kind. To which Hobbes replies, earthly rewards make consumerism a popular religion. And Calvin doesn't even miss a beat. A time to atone for one's own frugality. Uh, definitely missed the point about uh, personal reflection or introspection. And then for those of you that really like the absurd dad jokes, I found this, this cartoon. Um, get ready for your introspection. Okay, that's enough of that. So the basic message, I guess, to summarize, hopefully this will be a quick way of blessing for you, is in uh, chapter 5 and verse 8, hear, remember, and do or observe what God expects of us. You, you can think of that in terms of the, the agreement that we talked about. God wants, to, wants us to bind ourselves to him and follow him. Um, I hope you have a blessed rest of the week, and we'll see you in week four. Thanks. Bye.